Hi everyone, you're very welcome um, along to our parent workshop this morning. Um, my name is Ruth Davidson and uh, myself and Rebecca are here. We're in the room together. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start to take you through some of the overview and the first few topics um, and then I'll pass over to Rebecca um, and she'll do the kind of second half. Um, our overall aim, I guess, in doing this workshop is to help you as, as parents and guardians understand the, the basic ideas and principles of emotional responses and emotion uh, regulation. So we wanted to share with you sort of a psychologist's view of emotions um, and the regulation of them and sort of guide you towards applying these ideas in your everyday life as a parent or, or a guardian or a carer. So to sort of demystify it a wee bit um, and help you uh, sort of really apply the things at home. We'll start by sort of, um, you know, teaching you sort of the understanding of emotions and the basic understanding of emotions, um, emotions and behaviour and the sensory systems and emotions. So that's covered uh, first and I'll do that. Then I'll do a short piece on the brain and emotions um, and understanding the sort of neurobiology of emotional responses. And that can kind of be really helpful in sort of seeing, ah, well, that's why it is how it is. Um, and then Rebecca will take us through sort of understanding emotion regulation and how it develops um, kind of across the lifespan, across childhood, and then how parents can support their child's emotional regulation. The following week, um, we'll be looking more in detail, I suppose, at um, helping your child sort of develop emotional literacy, which is a sort of a, a core foundation skill for regulation, using sort of everyday tasks um, and strategies when your child is dysregulated, strategies as parents uh, to use and to have in our toolbox. And then we'll be looking a bit in detail at sort of more specific considerations around maybe neurodivergence or the developmental stage of your um, of your child. So just to encourage you as we're sort of going through, we obviously, these are sort of over, overarching principles and ideas. So just as you're going through, do please try and have in the back of your mind how this might apply to your child, your family. Throughout the presentation, what we've tried to do um, is sort of use this to draw your attention basically to when there's a key learning point or a take home point. So when you see this and we have a little text box or box around it, it's sort of just drawing your attention to the fact that this is a key idea. I'm just going to uh, show you this uh, diagram. So we're going to use this diagram, these three um, pink bubbles or circles. We're going to use it throughout the workshop just to help us understand um, all the factors, I suppose, that contribute to the development of emotion regulation. So it's called the biopsychosocial model. Some of you have probably come across it before. Um, it's widely used um, in sort of the, the field of psychology and other fields. So it's basically called the biopsychosocial model because it helps us understand something by thinking about the biological factors up the top there, the social or environmental factors over here on the right, or and the psychological factors. Um, so for all of us, our emotion regulation ability or our responses or how we see our child responding to emotionally triggering events, it's actually the culmination of a multitude of factors or things. So they're, they're illustrated here in this picture. So this diagram shows the many factors that contribute to our emotion regulation responses, basically, and those of our, our children. Um, so of course, there's far more than we've sort of included here. We've just given a few sort of sample, but there was like an endless number you could actually um, put here. And it's important to say that this is going to vary across time. Uh, it's going to vary for individuals um, and in, in different contexts, it's going to vary, which might be more or less important at any um, given time. So biological factors, for example, that might contribute to our ability to regulate ourselves emotionally might be our temperament, often genetically, uh, you know, genetically determined, um, our sleep, how rested we are, um, our diet, how well fed, how nourished if we're hungry, um, illness or medical condition or pain can be really important, um, our individual neurobiology. So if we're neurodivergent, uh, that is going to impact on our ability to regulate ourselves. Um, our sensory processing profile as well. And we're going to talk a bit more about sensory um, processing and how that relates. So they're all sort of biological or largely biological factors um, to think about. The psychological factors then over here might be things like stressful life events, past or present, um, our sort of thinking style, our reasoning ability, our ability to kind of think through things, and then past experiences, memory and trauma. So they would all impact on our ability 
to regulate ourselves in the in the here and now. Then the sort of social factors or the factors outside of that uh, would be things like our relationships with others, um, our, our parents or our parenting style, so how we were parented and how we parent, um, our the, the school setting or the play school or the creche or, or any settings like that, uh, friends, home life, the wider community and the physical environment. So there's lots of um, lots and lots of things to consider when you're, I suppose, reflecting on what has brought your child to the place of regulating themselves as they do, um, whether they're regulating themselves well or not so well. So you can see emotion regulation, it's, it's complex and multiple factors influence its development and it is a collection of skills. So there are lots of ways we can sort of talk about these skills. So for the purposes of this workshop, we chose the, the Yale University Ruler acronym. You can see it here. Um, so it's just a, a simple way to kind of break down the skills that all uh, lead to, you know, good emotion regulation. So they would be or recognising emotions in oneself and, and others, uh, understanding the causes and consequences of emotions, labelling emotions with a, a kind of rich vocabulary and um, expressing emotions in accordance with kind of cultural norms and social context and that's important because that can vary um, and then regulating emotions with helpful strategies. In this first, first section I'm just going to begin um, by explaining some really basic principles, uh, how we understand emotions, what they are and the role of the brain and the basic neurobiology of emotions. Strong feelings or strong emotions are an alert, sometimes a warning sign that we have an unmet need or that we need to pay attention to something that is going on around us. OK, they're a universal human experience um, and researchers have, you know, over, over years and years identified sort of core or universal emotions that are across culture, context and time, um, fear, anger, disgust, happiness and sadness. So if any of you have seen that movie Inside Out, you see you have the little characters here from the movie and they are those core emotions. So emotions, um, they played a crucial role in our evolutionary survival. So we literally would not have survived without them. So this caveman running from the tiger here would not have survived without his emotional fear response. And we talk about that a little bit more um, later on. But that's the first thing to say about them. Um, they're universal and they were crucial to our survival. So th the deal is we, um, you know, we have emotions that might feel pleasant or unpleasant, um, but the deal is that they are part of the human experience. Um, so one of the first steps we can take in trying to help our children with the development of emotion regulation is to understand that emotions are actually trying to help us, even if it doesn't seem that way, you know, a lot of the time or some of the time. So they drive our behaviour, they alert us to something we need to pay attention to or something we need to take action on. Okay, so for example, a uh, really kind of easy one to see is that fear or anxiety protects us or tries to protect us from danger or threat. Now it can get muddled up over time, but that's its basic, uh, basically what it's trying to do, what our brain is trying to do. Um, anger is sort of defence, so we're trying to defend ourselves, either if a physical threat has been detected, like our, our caveman in the last slide, or in kind of more modern times, if we detect a boundary has been breached or we're under threat in a social way. Um, disgust then is literally developed to, to protect us from being poisoned and now more social times, um, sort of social contamination, you can have that sort of disgust uh, response. Sadness, um, we it's a, it's a little less clear what its function is, but we think it's kind of a sign um, or plays a role in helping us kind of withdraw to heal or regroup and also plays a role in sort of empathy with others. And then happiness is about our pleasure and that good feeling and connection with others. So the take home point here you'll see with the, the little light bulb in the box um, is that emotions play a crucial role in protecting us, motivating us, alerting us. So as parents, it's helpful to try and move away from thinking as emotion, thinking of emotions as sort of good, bad feelings to sort of a curiosity to say, oh, what is this emotion telling me or alerting me to? And similarly, what is my child's emotional response telling me or alerting me to? Um, so that's sort of one jump we can make. Um, as parents and it's to remember that it's not the emotion itself that usually or sometimes causes difficulty but it's usually the resulting behaviour or how we respond to it can cause the, the difficulty or the problems. So I'm going to just um, bring you through quickly the sort of how we can pick apart our emotional response a wee bit. So our thoughts, 
our body feelings and our behaviours are all important parts of this sort of emotions cycle. So I'll give you an example in a second, but hopefully will help make it clearer. So our thoughts and our behaviours, they're driven by our emotions, but also they in turn fuel and drive the emotional response. So you've got this circular entangled relationship between what's going on in our mind, our body, and what we're doing and how we're feeling. So thoughts can include images, so it's not just like talking thoughts, but it's images, future imaginings, catastrophizing, for example, uh, memories or recall of past events and kind of self-talk. And they are all influenced here, you see the, the little um, arrow on the left, by sort of really strongly held or core beliefs. And Rebecca will sort of talk about them later as well. Um, the body feelings then are the physiological feelings associated with emotional response. So like your racing heart, your butterflies, your changes in energy levels. Um, this is driven by the arousal of our nervous system. And we'll come back to that in a second. Then the behaviour, so what we actually do, um, is driven by our emotions, but that can also, as I say, fuel our emotional response over time. So, for example, we might avoid something, our behaviour, because we're frightened of it, but this avoidance can actually increase our fear long term. Or we might withdraw socially because we're feeling sad, but the aloneness can actually then increase our sadness. So they have this really complex relationship. Um, and importantly as well, I'm going to draw your attention to the little box I have here with sensory system. So the sensory input can arouse or calm our nervous system and it can therefore influence this cycle of emotions. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. I'm going to give you this example. So this, um, so I've completed this example for how I might be feeling ahead of this morning's uh, presentation. So my thoughts might be, oh my goodness, I'm going to mess this up. I can't figure out this technology at all. I might feel anxious, nervous, maybe have some butterflies in my tummy, my body feelings, racing heart, my hands might be a bit sweaty. So that's all that uh, chemically driven body feelings. And then my behaviour might be I'll work really hard preparing and practising, which is quite helpful, or a more unhelpful thing to do might be to cancel the event. OK, so that's just an example. Um, so thinking about this thoughts, feelings, behaviour, cycle of emotions can help us kind of reflect, pick apart and understand what might be going on for ourselves um, or for our children. Um, and crucially to say that while it can be helpful to understand what's going on with our child, we also need to think about parts of this that might be more or less difficult or accessible for our children. So if our child is not using words to communicate, for example, it's going to be really hard to access the thoughts or cognitive part. We might need to kind of infer that, um, in which case we might focus more on their sort of behaviour, what they're doing or their body feelings, if we can see them reacting uh, physically. So um, in, in the next slide, then I'm going to make the point that emotions and behaviour are related and closely related, but they are separate and we can help our children. This is the in the take home point box here. We can help our children by understanding this and seeing their emotions and behaviours as separate. So, for example, you might say something like it's OK to feel angry or hurt or upset, but it's not OK to hit others. So you're helping your child see that how they feel and what they do are two separate things. So that's a really important um, thing for our children to understand if we want them to regulate their emotions um, in a more helpful or socially acceptable way. Um, so this this iceberg picture can be helpful as well. So you can see the iceberg shows the tip of the iceberg up there that the bit we actually see um, is just a fraction of the big picture or the, or the full story. Um, so we can do we can really help our children by by as parents looking beneath at what might be driving the bit that we see or the tip um, of the iceberg. Um, so what I'm going to do, I've the OTs and our team kindly uh, shared this slide from their um, sensory training workshop. Just to highlight when I mention sensory um, system, we're talking about the, the sort of five senses plus these two extra at the bottom. So the senses we all be most familiar with, uh, taste, smell, hearing, touch and sight. And then proprioception, which is that sense of our body in space, like where we are in relation to the world around us. 
and then vestibular, which is that sense of balance. We need to be aware of our children's sensory needs and challenges. For, so for some people, uh, sensory input can be really hard to uh, interpret in a managed way, can have trouble filtering out sensory input. Um, so that's, you know, and everyone's different with that. So it's really important to consider it for your child. It might not play a big role for your child, depending, or it might be a really Play, play a really significant role. The two sort of take home points, I suppose, in relation to the sensory system um, and emotions is the first one over there is to think about your child's sensory needs. So can I remove or add sensory inputs that will calm my child's nervous system? Because remember that calming of the nervous system will calm their emotional response. Um, and are my child's sensory needs being sort of consistently met across their day, across their week? Um, mm -hmm. And are there regulation difficulties related to sensory overwhelm or not? So again, these are just questions to think about. Um, then the other box I have there um, beside it is to think about my sensory needs as a parent. So children uh, produce lots of sensory input of different types, as you all will know. Um, so as a parent to sort of reflect on, is this impacting on my ability to respond in the moment as I would like to? So there are sort of two bits to think about in relation to uh, the sensory system and emotions. So now that I've covered some of the basic ideas about emotions, we're just going to take a look at what actually happens during an emotional arousal situation or event, if you like. So most of us have these peaks and troughs or ups and downs of emotion, arousal and calm throughout the day. So our day kind of looks like that peaks and troughs, ups and downs. Some are higher and lower than others, might depend on the day, the demands or a personal style of responding. So it can be helpful to think about your child as they move through their, through their day or through their week as being being in either the red zone down here, the orange or the or sorry, the green zone, the orange zone or the red zone. You can see them on the, the curve there. So the red zone, easy to spot. It's when a person is highly dysregulated, upset, distressed. This is where most of us as parents want to avoid. No one wants to be there. Um, it's often the most explosive place, highly charged, lots of energy, especially if you're dealing with emotions such as anger or anxiety. The green zone then down the kind of bottom is where we're managing well. Our child's calm, well regulated, everything's going well and they're able to manage the demands on them. Then the orange zone is kind of on the way up and the way down. That's where we're sort of beginning to feel emotional arousal. Our behaviour might start to change. You'll notice maybe subtle signs in your child. They're feeling a bit anxious, stressed, frustrated, but it's at a lower level than the red zone. So you can see, you know, from this, we might be going through a day. Um, something might trigger us and we might get emotionally aroused from it. Sometimes it might just tip up into orange zone, then back down. Other times it might keep going all the way up to, to red zone, depending what else is going, going on. We always, you know, come out the other side and calm down again. So the homeostasis in our body makes sure of that. Um, but I'm sure you'll agree that a child in the red zone is usually the most upsetting for, for adults and for parents and the most difficult situation to sort of respond to. So just the two take home points are to remember, I suppose, is that we need to know our child's triggers and know the signs my child's in the orange zone. And if possible, to reach out and help them before they actually escalate up to that red zone. Once they're in the red zone, there is actually very little we can do except keep calm, don't add fuel to the fire and keep everyone physically safe. So actually the time we want to be doing the most work as parents is when they're in the green zone or the orange zone. We'll come back to that later. A crucial skill is to step pause, step back um, and see the situation from your child's sort of point of view. And that might reflect, you know, might look like reflecting on what has led to this move from green zone to orange zone to red zone. So this example with the volcano here, I just found these uh, images online I thought they they were quite uh, nice at illustrating it. So <clears throat> this example shows a possible journey to the red zone, if you like. OK, so if you think about uh, your child, as they move through their day, they might start off putting on their socks and shoes. Maybe the, they're too tight. Maybe the seams are digging in. Maybe they can't manage fastening them up. A little bit of frustration builds. Then they head downstairs. Someone starts the blender in the kitchen. That's another sensory demand. Next they're off to play school or school or wherever they're going and it's music class and all the demands and kind of sensory input involved in that. Next, 
they might be heading off their next sort of activity and they get bumped in the corridor. OK, and that's another stressor. And you can see the volcanoes getting taller and closer to eruption. So you might see the child might be sort of in an orange zone at this stage. Then their clothes might get you know wet in the yard at playtime. And again, you've got the kind of sensory bit of that. Um, the sensory demand of that might make them uncomfortable. And then finally, you, you know, you might pick them up, bring them home and you give them the blue cup instead of the green cup. OK, and you see this really strong emotional response. So it could be disappointment, upset, anger, could involve crying, screaming, hitting, collapsing on the ground. OK, and you can see um, you can see from that example, it's not really about the cup at all. It's about all that's come before. So as parents, you can see this little picture here. We want to think about the big picture. Think about what has brought your child into orange, red, what is going on? Let's have to kind of step back and reflect on that. And we can think about the sort of sensory demands on our children, uh, the social demands on them, uh, so interacting with other people, expectations of adults, which there's lots and lots of expectations from parents. Us as parents, we expect lots of things from our children and teachers and SNAs and all the other adults in their life. And um, then there's kind of the academic or learning demands, uh, communication demands, unexpected changes, and then you've got underlying sort of physiological stresses um, or discomfort, illness, hunger, pain, tiredness, all those. So there's lots and lots um, to think about um, as parents. So next I'm going to show you a really short um, video just explaining the sort of fight flight response and we're going to look a little bit um, at the brain biology behind the sort of green orange red zone states of arousal. I should say as well the brain is obviously massively complex so we've really simplified it for the purposes of this uh, presentation. Fear is so important for our survival we do something absolutely remarkable. Our bodies begin to react to a threat before we're even consciously aware of what the threat might be. Because when we're faced with danger, milliseconds count. At the first hint of danger, early warning signals are sent to the brain via the optic nerve to our tiny and primitive fear center, the amygdala. This prepares our body for action. Next, nerve pulses are fired down the spinal cord to the adrenal glands near our kidneys. This triggers a release of adrenaline. Now we're on full alert. Adrenaline is the vital hormone that can flood our body in a split second. As it reaches our lungs, we breathe more deeply and take in more oxygen. It also makes our heart beat faster. Oxygen-rich blood is diverted to our muscles. They are now charged springs, waiting for the signal to run or fight. All this before our conscious mind has even registered a threat. This reaction to fear has evolved over millions of years and is known as the fight or flight response. So as you can see, I'm going to just give you a quick, um, th this picture here now you can see, just shows as in that video, the two, there's two sort of main parts of the brain to know about when we're trying to understand um, emotions and our emotion response. So as I mentioned in the video, tucked away here underneath the back is our sort of uh, caveman brain, or we can call it like the lizard brain when we're explaining to our children. Uh, it's part of the limbic system. It's that really evolutionary seat of our fear system that help, helped us survive. Not terribly logical, it's, but it's quick to react. So it's good in emergency like in, you saw in the video. It's not really open to learning by lectures or by telling it. It has to experience things to learn. Um, and it's very closely tied to sort of our memory centre. Um, the wizard brain, our logical brain, um, is kind of your prefrontal cortex and cortex, the kind of more um, evolutionary later part up at the top here. Um, it's logical. It's not so quick to react, so it works a bit slower, learns through reasoning and logic. 
if our lizard brain or amygdala is really active, our clever uh, sort of logical brain is kind of temporarily shut down. OK, so we need to kind of calm our amygdala and our lizard brain to allow our sort of wizard logical brain to work properly. OK, and when it's fully developed and fully working optimally, it sort of regulates and inhibits our responses. Not fully developed our mid 20s um, and that's most people probably are, are aware of that um, sort of mid 20s. We think it's, it's kind of pretty much fully uh, functioning. So I'm going to uh, just remind you if you think about the green, orange and red zones in the green zone, wizard brain is dominant. OK, but in the red zone in the middle here, our lizard brain, our amygdala is dominant. It's in the driving seat. OK, so you can see when we're in the red zone and lizard brain is dominant, OK, that's going to guide our response as parents and it reminds us why certain strategies, so talking or reasoning, are not going to be effective when lizard brain is dominant, when that's in, in the driving seat in the red zone. OK, um, we want to keep that for when wizard brain is more accessible and functioning um, at its optimal, if you like. OK, so I'm just going to finish up really quickly with these kind of summary points before I hand over to Rebecca. Um, so depending on your child's sort of age and developmental stage, it can be useful to sort of explain this wizard brain, lizard brain idea to them. And there's kind of the hand model of the brain and we'll share links to videos and demonstrations of that kind of later on. Um, and remember, our brains are not fully developed in our 20s um, and there can also be kind of lagging skills in this area for neuro neurodivergent people, in particular people with ADHD or autistic individuals. Um, so we want to have a realistic expectation, I suppose, of what uh, what we can expect ourselves and our children to be doing. Um, and just to say as well, the brain, it's, it's a really complex organ and like any organ, its ability to function optimally is really easily impacted by basic physiological needs. So hunger, thirst and tiredness, sensory input, physical discomfort. OK, they can all impact how well our brain is able to function.